is the continuation of last week's lecture, which was uh, my attempt of explaining the chaotic state of the world at this time, the influence of an incoming energy called the fourth ray. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about the seven rays. We gave examples and graphs, which uh, we may go over uh, a little later. We also tonight, I have two vignettes uh, concerning uh, completely different things. Uh, one of them is uh, a conversation that a group of people uh, had or were having uh, maybe a week or so ago about uh, the age of souls on the planet. And I'm going to draw a graph that will explain that uh, very nicely. And the, uh, the diagram should fulfill and answer a lot of questions that people had concerning uh, things like uh, the equality uh, people and the souls, the incoming souls into the planet uh, over the past history and the new uh, incoming souls that are just now coming in, preparing for the Aquarian age. Uh, the other vignette was concerns uh, a, a news item uh, involving a young man named Brian Laundry and an analysis or an observation in my analysis of the observation that I have made concerning certain physiological features of Brian Laundry and their relationship to esoteric anatomy. And what I mean, what I believe, well, I'm, I'm still working on it. And we'll discuss it possibly next week or in the following week of uh, Lemurian karma. Certain Lemurian aspects are prominent in his physi physical appearance. And uh, we'll talk about that, but right now we, uh, we're taking up where we left off last week concerning the uh, uh, a large part of the hysteria of the world, which, as I told you, Steiner had predicted that the uh, mass mental illness, uh, Baker talked about it too, in a little different vein uh, than Steiner, but nonetheless, there are curious similarities. Mm -hmm. And the mass mental illness in America at this time manifesting itself as hysteria. And we see it in the political arena and certainly just in the mainstream media largely, but in people too. You know, I had a terrible experience in a grocery store here uh, in the little town I live in in Michigan, Rochester, Michigan. Hello. And uh, uh, when the hysteria over the COVID or Chinese virus started, uh, I can remember going down the aisle in the grocery store the wrong way and some young mother who was probably in her late 20s yelling at me that I was going the wrong way. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced anything like that. But uh, yeah, she was... Uh, was having a meltdown. Anyway, Steiner said that the, the mass mental illness in America in the 21st century would be hysteria. Baker just called it mania. Mm. And uh, I uh, talked about it at some length when I gave my uh, uh, lecture on the horoscope of Barack Hussein Obama how he was able to ignite the fire of the mass mania in America. And people were absolutely hysterical about it. Uh, it's worth thinking about, mass hysteria. Uh, so anyway, we, we, I think we did go over these last week. We'll start with this again. 
of hysteria-based events uh, that took place beginning in 2000 with the Y2K event where everybody was convinced, not everybody, but uh, a lot of people, and it was in the news, was this whole idea that Y2K was going to cause our computers all to collapse. And people were, again, hysterical about it. The anthrax uh, issue uh, in 2001, a year later, which also coincided with the events of uh, 911. Uh, which we did talk about, but may discuss again in some detail. West Nile virus, the hysteria and paranoia of the West Nile virus. Um, SARS, that was another one. In 2003, the bird flu. In 2005, E. coli, uh, which was a part of a lecture that I gave uh, a year or so ago on the origins of AIDS and uh, two opposing views, medical hypothesis. I don't think you want to move that around too much, do you, Huli? Yeah, camera? I do. Okay. Uh, so anyway, we did talk about E. coli and its similar origin to AIDS as uh, one of the possibilities. It was interesting when we gave that lecture because it was right at the time where the whole thing was emerging about uh, COVID-19. And some coincidental event, I started talking about viruses. And one of the viruses, of course, that was been, and still is a great concern, is the HIV-1 virus or AIDS and E. coli, which I believe is even more treacherous. Uh, the interesting thing about the AIDS and the E. coli, and I'll just add because it has a relationship in a, in a way, a distant way, to Brian Laundry, and that is, is that they were viruses of Lemurian origin. Mm -hmm. And they have lain dormant in the soil for millions of years. We'll talk about that. I think they time. find a cure, don't they? For those things? No, no. There's no cure for E. coli. And uh, uh, AIDS is uh, it, 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 the second hypothesis on the origin of AIDS was that it was an accident that was created by the World Health Organization who were trying to uh, uh, create a uh, mass uh, evacuation of cent uh, uh, inoculation of Central Africa uh, and they, uh, to eradicate smallpox. It's a documented event. I read from a brilliant paper that a genius friend of mine at General Motors wrote. Uh, it would be a lecture that would be, I think, fun to give again because it's just so thought provoking. Uh, but anyway, this friend of mine said that they had created the AIDS virus. This isn't our subject tonight, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, through an accident where they had taken cattle, they would score the inside loins of the cattle and then give them the, the smallpox uh, virus. And then the cattle would produce the uh, anti-serum. Uh, and uh, the problem they had was that not too many people know this unless you're involved in uh, veterinary uh, work and that sort of a thing that the majority of cattle in the world, uh, they don't in America, but uh, we kill them before they mature, really live out their lives. But most cattle and a lot of bovine creatures die of bovine leukemia virus throughout the world. Unbeknown to the Russian and French scientists uh, who were creating the serum, the antidote to the smallpox, the animals that, that they were using, not all of them, but a few of them, were suffering from uh, bovine leukemia virus. 
And what they did when they gave them the smallpox was they create a hybridized viruses. Viruses will cross breed and, and create mutant strains. And uh, I think that's really one of the deep, deep fears that Fauci has is that the problem could, not, not now, not saying now, but it could be uh, much worse than it is because they could mutate the virus into something that was really and truly deadly and, and kill tens of millions of people across the world. Anyway, so they artificially created AIDS through an accident. And the friend of mine says that if his hypothesis is correct, then they only needed to follow it backwards to create the antibodies for, for HIV. They could actually make a vaccination against HIV, which would be a, a wonderful thing. I'm not sure that my friend's hypothesis is correct, but I can't dispute it. It's, it's beyond my pay grade and uh, it's a possibility. Anyway, so we had the E. coli scare and then the bad economy and then swine flu and then the BP oil gusher in the Gulf or wherever it was that was going to ruin everything. And then the Maya, Mayan calendar hysteria. I remember giving a lecture on that 2012, the mass hysteria of uh, the planet in anticipation of some horrific event that was going to take place uh, uh, concerning the Mayan calendar and December 21st. And the truth was, was that nothing happened. I spoke to 600 people uh, in uh, Eastern Tennessee, Asheville, North Carolina area on this subject and told them that it simply boiled down to the fact that the, the Mayans had to end their calendar somewhere. And so they ended it on the winter solstice of 2012. Mm -hmm. And of course, nothing ever came of it. North Korea, the great fear of North Korea uh, with uh, uh, their uh, armaments that could destroy the city of Seoul and war breaking out with North Korea and South Korea and all that. Uh, uh, oh, that was the E. coli. Here's the Ebola. I made a mistake. 2014 was the Ebola virus. I called the E. coli uh, the Ebola, but it was, it was uh, E. coli in 2006 and the Ebola in 2014. Disney measles uh, and ISIS that was going to kill everybody. Uh, Zika virus, the coronavirus. So it's always some hysteria that people are living in this fear of some uh, anticipation of the unknown. And of course, that is one of the great fears of the majority of mankind is the unknown. What, uh, what was the, the World Trade Towers? Of course, that was a tremendous event. And I told you that story about how I in, saw the whole thing happen uh, on the weekend of Labor Day uh, 2001, September 1st, 2nd, 3rd, I was home by myself and actually witnessed this uh, 10 days before it happened uh, in my meditation room. I was told two weeks earlier in Spino, Italy, that there were students in the group that would begin to have experiences in conscious mediumship. And I was one of them, a friend of mine who was the treasurer and secretary for the Theosophical Society in England, a man by the name of David Harvey. A year after the 911 event, I was telling him about my vision uh, after I had come out of meditation and saw these scale models about four and a half feet tall collapsing in my den there where I meditated. And, uh, he said, yeah, he said, I had a similar experience. He said, I was on the plane. Now, David Harvey was at this meeting, the summer school program put on by Clergate College of England and Dr. Baker. And uh, it was Baker who told us that 
there were some people in the group that would begin to have these experiences. And David Harvey was one of them. And the story that he related to me, it's worth repeating, is that his vision was that he was on the plane. And he could see that the plane was headed into the World Trade Towers. My vision was the, which you see right there, uh, the collapsing of the Trade Towers, pancake down. I believe that there may have been angelic forces that were involved in the destruction of the World Trade Towers insofar as the pancaking took place. Of course, the conspiracy theorists, theorists say that they were artificial charges were set off and that caused it, but that wasn't it at all. Because when I had the vision of the Trade Towers, one of the things that I was trying to rationalize was what happened if they fell over? Say thousands and thousands more people would have been killed. But to minimize the death, it had to pancake down on itself. Now, something that's worth thinking about, I don't know where to take it, but uh, a friend of mine and I were discussing the trade towers, and he said that he was reading the Bible where Samson had pushed the pillars in and that there were 3,000 people who were on the roof of the building and that they were all killed when Samson, in the Bible story, had pushed the pillars in and he was trying to equate some significance. What is significant about the trade towers is that they are Gemini features, morphologically speaking. They ape the the, the glyph of Gemini and that the moon had just transited Gemini at the time of the first plane hitting the World Trade Towers. And so being somewhat of an astrologer, I find that much more significant than the Bible story of uh, Samson pushing the pillars in. Okay, I'm not getting anywhere with this, Huli. Uh, interesting. Keep it exciting. <laughs> yeah, one of the things, about 60% of the population of the world has a fourth ray mind. And what happens with the fourth ray mind is that they're constantly creating mental crisis. That's why it's so easy to breed hysteria, particularly in America with a second ray soul and a sixth ray uh, personality. Uh, but what happens is the fourth ray mind creates a crisis and then it resolves the crisis. And then it creates a greater crisis and then it resolves that. So it's continually creating the old story that we've all heard or the analogy that explains it is, is that somebody's life is just going perfectly and then they screw everything up. That's characteristic of a fourth ray of mind. And so you can see here how this, this whole thing works, a, a resolution to a karma. They create a plateau of harmony then they create a new crisis and then another plateau of harmony and then greater and greater crisis, which eventually leads to hopefully some sort of a, a, a spiritual understanding, but it's through the suffering. Uh, we all try to avoid suffering, but uh, Blavatsky says, woe to those who live without suffering for their fate is stagnation. That means you're not growing. And so many people will have lives of relative ease for a number of reasons. Uh, but uh, uh, if you're not struggling and surmounting problems, you're not really growing spiritually. Uh, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is the uh, uh, an explanation for the uh, uh, a mongoloid child, uh, a child who is 
uh, retarded or special needs, we call it nowadays. I've had people scold me for using the medical term mongoloid. So uh, we'll try to avoid that. Anyway, uh, what happens with the mongoloid child is uh, in the greatest percentage of cases, they've lived a series of lives that have been very mentally stressful. And they will incarnate into a life where there is no mental stress because the mongoloid child does not have the capacity in most cases uh, to experience uh, the mental stress that had plagued them over a series of lives. They are uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt, usually very loving children and, uh, and unable to really get too rattled. Some do, there's always exceptions to the rule, but the majority uh, of the times they've taken on this body that is mentally uh, slow, we'll say, uh, to, to rest the mental atoms, the, the reincarnating mental atoms. And uh, it's worth thinking about. So, uh, yeah, we're wondering, many of us, about the impacts of social distancing, long distance learning. Uh, uh, I don't like it. Uh, I think there's great benefit for children, especially being together, friendship. It's what we're doing is we're alienating, creating alienation of the children. And uh, they develop skills, social skills. Interaction with other children is, uh, is a really beautiful thing. Uh, but it's bringing about temporarily changes in parenting and socializing. And I think the great lesson that we'll learn out of it is, is that we don't like its effect. One of the things that many of the students talk about in the, in the uh, uh, esoteric teachings, uh, Leadbeater talked about it, Alice Bailey talked about it, certainly Douglas Baker talked about the importance of 2025 and a new world renaissance period. I can already see it happening in America. One of the things that the fourth ray does, the ray of art and harmony through conflict, is it uh, uh, creates city-state governments. Every night on the news, there is some, <coughs> excuse me, disagreement uh, between state governors and the federal government. And what fourth ray energy will do is it will bring about city state rule and it will be the actual energy and the force behind decentralized government and draining the swamp in Washington, DC, which is long overdue to be drained. It will happen. It is an undeniable event. They're right now fighting for as much control in Washington as they can get. And uh, it's a losing battle. Uh, we're just really beginning to see the tip of the iceberg uh, as far as the, the incoming fourth ray energy and how it will uh, deconstruct the old system of a centralized government. You always have uh, expansion and contraction. It's like a breathing process where the lung, lungs expand and contract. And so too do the energies of the planet. Uh, they're experiencing it in, in, in uh, Europe as well. And there are protests constantly. We'll start having them here in America too. Uh, although the Americans are pretty spoiled and passe. Uh, they have a what the French call a laissez-faire attitude about life because they really had it too easy. Ultimately, what has to happen with this fourth ray energy is, is that it will destroy the old forms of government. 
and the new regional governments, power back to the states, which was always the issue when the uh, founding fathers were meeting in Philadelphia, the issue was states rights versus federal rights. That's exactly what they're talking about now. States rights versus federal rights. We look at the Texas border, see? How can the federal government tell the state of Texas what they can and can't do, see? So uh, it's gonna be really interesting uh, to see because it's, uh, it's all about the fourth ray. And that's what our lecture is about. The uh, new fuel sources that are coming into the world, uh, microwave centers uh, that Nikola Tesla talked about a uh, hundred years ago or more. <coughs> the CERN collider in Basel, Switzerland. <coughs> Excuse me, it's said to be built on farmland, on the land that was owned by Paracelsus, <coughs> one of the great initiates uh, of the world. It's interesting that they would build it there in that particular place, but lo and behold, uh, they've selected it. So there's a lot of really exciting and wonderful things that are coming through the fourth ray. We've talked about colonization of the moon <clears throat> and the effects that the earth, because of its expanding population, has had on the astral body, helping to create an astral body of the moon. The reason nobody can stay human beings, uh, animals too, uh, can't stay for a prolonged period of time on the moon is that it doesn't have a well-developed astral body. Its astral body was destroyed uh, billions of years ago when there was a human life form that only reached the astral level on the moon. And when you read the esoteric writings, they talk about the transportation of souls, boatloads, Blavatsky said, of souls from the moon to the earth chain because the moon was being destroyed. In the ancient times, the moon was very close to the earth. And uh, it was so close that you could look from horizon to horizon and see the moon. And the moon was acting as a shield to the earth, protecting it from cosmic bombardment and protecting the earth as a mother would protect her child or baby or some animal that it loved, protecting it from harm. And now the roles are reversed. And now the earth is acting as the mother to the moon and the moon is the child. We go through similar things in the adult human experience. I can remember my mother in the last days of her life uh, working in a nursing home and saying that once an adult, twice a child, how we mature into adult stage and then we, uh, we uh, uh, become childlike again. And uh, you might want to turn that off if you can. Can you turn it off? <laughs> Help her out there, There you go. Yeah, you can. And make sure your phones are turned off. Yeah, there you go. Dude. Remind me to turn it back on. Please. Okay, please, because I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway. so the colonization of the moon, what is happening is the tremendous expansion of population of the earth has caused the astral body of the earth to grow and expand. And it is just now touching the surface of the moon and the moon is reacting because the gravity, this is initiate knowledge and there isn't anything written about it. So you can look in all the Alice Bailey books you want, and all the Blavatsky literature you want, you, you won't find anything about it. This is new stuff. And so what's happening is we're having an increase in volcanic tsunami, uh, earthquake activity on the earth because the gravitational pull of the 
moon on the earth is being affected by the expanding astral body of the earth, which will eventually encapsulate the moon. The moon will be stabilized and it will also become more inhabitable because it will have an astral body that eventually uh, will be uh, magnified by the colonization of the moon by na different nations of the world, and they will contribute to the astral body of the moon, therefore allowing life to exist on the moon, which is moving away from the earth at a very <coughs> slow pace, but nonetheless moving away. And uh, it will be colonized. Uh, it was once said, I remember, in one of Dr. Baker's lectures, it may be that the most valuable thing that we have is our DNA. And that in this way, we will spread our DNA throughout the universe into other planetary chains. And if the moon becomes inhabited and it creates an atmosphere, which it will because it has water. And if the other prophecies that Baker has talked about and that I've certainly talked about, uh, the uh, desalination of ocean water to irrigate the deserts of the world, then the salt byproduct becomes a problem. And we have to, through uh, something that NASA is already talking about, a space elevator, uh, a space elevator to the moon, and we would ship the, the salt from the desalination process uh, and create shallow saltwater seas on the moon and begin to create an atmosphere on the moon and clouds and rain. And it's not, it sounds way out, but we're living in the age of science fiction. And I'm not making this up. These, these are ideas that NASA is talking about and uh, considering, and they have uh, extremely occult and esoteric ramifications that we should all be considering if you're a serious student of the wisdom teachings. One of the things too, that the world is in anticipation of, particularly the Christian world, but really all of the great religions of the world is the return of the Christ. And uh, so we have listed here uh, 15 uh, of the criterion for the reappearance of the Christ. Uh, one, he has the sure bodily signs of having suffered more than any. He is a teacher teaching mankind from across the earth. He is a trained healer, always healing at some level those near and far from him. He operates outwardly on the ray of will and inwardly on the ray of love wisdom. He is impoverished and celibate. Six, he is constantly under attack from innumerable, innumerable directions. Seven, he is surrounded and supported by those who have sacrificed or surrendered something of their lives to him. Eight, he is taken for granted by the thousands who have met him or know of him, but not always so. Nine, he has appeared on radio and television as Alice Bailey said he would. 10, his miracles are in his works where they should be, and they have grown prodigiously for those who care to examine them patiently. Alfred Lord Tennyson, noted for his seership, forecast accurately the birth of the Christ. It is said that avatars are born when great temples are burnt to the ground and at the hour of his birth, the most famous in the esoteric world was thus consumed. Rudolf Steiner had a hand in that. He is known esoterically to his closest friends who support his work against concerted attacks. 14. He is anxious to avoid emotion and sensationalism and therefore maintains for the time being a low profile, traveling incognito. 15, these, ob these observations are put up collectively by his friends, most of whom have been so for many years, 
and they are located around the world and some administered for him. The problem that I have with all these people, whoever they are, even esoteric groups who are living in anticipation of the Christ is that they have no criteria. What is your criteria that you use for identifying the Christ? Well, they don't have, they always give these real weak uh, comments. So that completes the lecture on the fourth ray. And what I want to do now, if we can shift Julia, yes. over to the board over here, I'm going to try to explain the two vignettes that we had talked about earlier. And the first vignette concerns uh, soul age the age of souls, and it can best be explained by a football type uh, of design. And the we're hypothetically saying that the souls, 63,000 million monads, uh, are 63 billion monads or souls divine, are seeking expression on the earth chain of uh, evolution. And that a portion of these, these uh, souls are young souls. And they incorporate a small degree of uh, this region of this graph that I'm using. And over here are advanced souls, uh, probably an even smaller group. And in the middle, in the middle of the, this group are the average group of souls. And that explains, the, we're not equal as far as the age of the soul is concerned. Uh, I don't need a law to tell me that I shouldn't kill somebody, but there are people who do need those laws. And uh, there are people who we could say were young souls or involutionary is the term that we use in the, in the uh, esoteric schools throughout the world, various ashrams and schools. The second issue that I wanted to talk about tonight because it's interesting, I guess we've got a little time so we can have question and answers after word two. Uh, we're right on schedule is the news item that has been plaguing the televisions uh, over the last several weeks is uh, the murder of uh, a young woman by her boyfriend, uh, uh, Brian Laundrie is his name. And one of the things as a student of the wisdom teachings and as a student of <clears throat> esoteric anatomy, which almost nobody on the planet ever talks about, even the most ardent students uh, don't know really anything about esoteric anatomy. I noticed in the young boy that he appeared to be much, much older than his actual age. That concerned me a little bit. But the thing that I found two things I found to be troublesome about him, and I'm going to investigate it, and we will talk about it in future lectures, is that his hands are enormous. Now, I have large hands. I can actually pick a basketball up with one hand. Uh, his fingers are about an inch longer than mine and are at least one and a half times the diameter of my fingers. Uh, that concerned me, and I thought I'm only I'm only hypothesizing. Now I'm making I'm just I'm just letting this out into the world. Uh, I have a feeling that he strangled her. He used his hands and he strangled her. But probably even more incredible than his hands, which to me are grotesque. They're not pretty hands. My father had beautiful hands and played the piano as a, as a young boy. 
and uh, he, he just from man to have hands like that is, is extraordinary. Anyway, uh, the other concern about Brian Laundry was the shape of his his cranium, which I'm exaggerating here a little bit, but but not too much. And uh, his cranium is elongated. Mm -hmm. It is what's called acrocephalic. Acrocephalic comes about, it was part of the third root race, um, the Lemurian, we call it, root race. And the acrocephalic head, I've exaggerated it considerably, but he has an unusual shaped head. It's not like that extreme, but I have known families, as fate would have it, growing up in a little town in Indiana of about 1,200, 1,500 people, there was a family who had, among the, the, the male members of the family, uh, had this uh, almost watermelon shape in a way, uh, head, which is called in medical terminologies acrocephalic. We've all heard of hydrocephalic, which means water, a baby with a water head, a huge, huge head. But his head is acrocephalic, and it's reminiscent of Lemurian types of the third root race, the early third root race, because what was happening in the third root race, this extension of the posterior. Uh, foreman, foreman is uh, out of it came a, uh, a, a little pedestal like with an eye and it wasn't a human eye it was an eye that sensed heat the teachings tell us Blavatsky and others tell us because the earth at that time was highly volcanic and they could sense sometimes the earth would just open up around them you know and or behind them and they had this sensory gland, we call it an eye, a posterior eye. Uh, and, uh, and so that was a remnant of a time when there was an eye back here, not, not in the forebrain, but in the posterior region of the brain. So my concern, I haven't looked at his horoscope. I've got to get his horoscope done. But I'm thinking there is a good chance that he has Lemurian karma. There's something very disturbing about his secrecy and evasion from the police and from uh, his parents helping protect him. Uh, is a concern of mine, and that he may meet some very violent uh, kind of a karma, very unusual karma, who knows, eaten by an alligator or something, or, or you could go to prison and, and then be a target in prison, which uh, prisons are hell holes. I was, uh, when I got back from Vietnam for uh, just a couple of times, I was lucky. Uh, uh, where I had to pull prison guard duty on the weekends. And I used to take the guys out of prison with a loaded shotgun and march them down to the JAG office, the judge, adjutant general. And they always told us, they said, now if they escape, just shoot them in the legs and uh, don't, you know, don't try to kill them. So uh, you know, they wanted them to stand trial for whatever their crimes were. And uh, uh, his fate, whatever his fate is, it's not good. I, I'm sensing that, but I'll know more when I get his horoscope and I take a look at his his horoscope. But there's violent. Uh, there's got to be violent karma in there, and it and it could be, I believe, of a Lemurian uh, uh, origin. But we'll see. Uh, these things are. Uh, shown in the horoscope and, and I'll decipher it and uh, in another maybe two weeks I'll give a talk on the uh, on his chart now 
Cooley, do we want to open up here for uh, question and answers from people here in the room and people who may have tuned in tonight on the Zoom Zoom lecture? I'll be open for uh, a couple of questions. Okay, Angel says she has the comment. Angel, uh, please unmute yourself. Yes, I'm already. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Uh, great uh, lecture tonight, David. Uh, with regard, I want to I want to go back uh, first to 9/11. My understanding right now is that what occurred then was the Clintons were actually um, forced to sign the act for the new quantum banking system to come into reality. And then Bush got in and they knew the date was 9-11 and thus the reason why that happened. It was a complete in-house job regarding diversion of the subject. Um, as you know, the Bushes, the Obamas, the Clintons have had a certain agenda. We are on the cusp of having this new quantum banking system put into place uh, and it is imminent, imminent. And this is why shadow has been kicking and screaming and doing all sorts of weather warfare and the like. Um, they are now trying to do two things. One of them's comical. They're trying to dismantle the space um, <laughs> the space division of the military, not gonna happen. I don't think they understand the forces that are actually involved in that. The second one is they are now trying to take everyone's guns away. This is their last desperate uh, grasp. But I wanted to share with the group the historical reason behind the date that was chosen. So we were gonna get the new quantum banking system to be enacted on this 9-11, but because of certain things at play, they had to move it, but it is imminent. With regard to Brian Laundry, I would just like to share, it's interesting because when you look at the pharaohs of Egypt, you will see that Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti also had those odd shaped heads. And it turns out they were from the planet Sirius. So there is a whole nother subject there. I, I'm not suggesting he's part of that. I agree with you, uh, David, that definitely the head shape and the um, orifice or what have you in the back of the head definitely is Lemurian. I too had really negative vibe the first time I saw his picture. So um, thank you for doing that work. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have a question or comment? You have to unmute yourself uh, to speak up. Um, anybody here in the room? Oh, others are thinking. Our Zoom friends are thinking about questions. Okay, well, that was a lot of information to take in. Uh, we certainly covered a very broad spectrum uh, in our uh, discourse this evening in an appallingly brief period of time. Did you want to? Yeah, say I just want to. I just wanted to have a clarification. So when you uh, talk about like all the events, right? Mm -hmm. What happened? All these other viruses. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get exactly what was your point. I mean, what, 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 hysteria. Hysteria, yeah. So hysteria is the point. I see. Okay. That Americans are prone to hysteria. He, and they're prone to hysteria because it, it's a nation of love raised primarily, a second ray soul, which they share with England, and a uh, sixth ray uh, personality. The rays two, four, and six are love rays, and it makes them prone to things like socialism or believing to the chagrin of the spiritual hierarchy of the planet, I might add. Uh, 
uh, America is unique in all of the world. And it has the blessings and has been energized by the spiritual hierarchy of the planet to set examples for the entire rest of the world to follow. 50 or 60 some nations in the world use the Declaration of Independence uh, as a foundation for their country's beliefs. This has all come about in the last 200 years or so. Um, we're we're uh, an experiment by the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. I gave a lecture years ago where I was actually overshadowed by an immense being who uh, spoke through me. And the lecture that I gave came at a time when uh, South Africa was under attack for apartheid. And I, I lived down there for a short time with some of the most incredible uh, people that you could ever imagine. And in of all places, South Africa, the last place you would ever look, an English couple who were mystics and were direct disciples of DK and other masters. In fact, that picture of DK belonged to the, the woman, uh, the wife. Uh, Dr. Joseph Busby, her name was uh, Lulu, Louise Busby, we called her Lulu, and uh, it was painted by Annie Gowland. Anyway, uh, the South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, England, are all part of the Anglo-Saxon subrace. And uh, that is the fifth subrace of the fifth root race. And their time is now in the world. There is no mistake that America is the most powerful nation in the world. There is no mistake of the affinity uh, that exists between uh, these countries that I just named, especially England, and, uh, and America, and of course, Canada uh, being incorporated into that. It's all part and parcel of the energizing work uh, and the plan of the, uh, an unfoldment of a plan set up by the spiritual hierarchy of the world. The real deep esoteric truth of what I said tonight about 2025 is that the plan of the spiritual hierarchy is that it is supposed to unfold in America first. But before it can unfold in America, as I was told in confidence by a powerful being, is that the dweller on the threshold, if you're a Nellis Bailey student, you'll be familiar with that term, the Dweller on the threshold of America was never destroyed after World War II, but it was in Europe. And that the spiritual hierarchy says that if the dweller, that's the sum total of the evil of America, is not done away with, we'll talk about a little further here in a minute, if it's not destroyed, then the selection will be, and the favor will be given to Europe uh, to uh, be the expression of the, the new world renaissance. Uh, we're hoping, I'm hoping, <clears throat> members of the ashram that I belong to are hoping that uh, America will be able to surmount this incredible war that it's going through with uh, the media, uh, the politics in Washington, and that will become victorious, that good will surmount evil. And in so doing, uh, America will lead the world into the golden age or into the age of Aquarius and into a new world renaissance. I am really and truly hoping that that will happen. And I do see glimmers of hope. I think what we're witnessing now 
is the tip of the iceberg and that the truth about certain things will come out that will destroy uh, planetary evil. And it won't be just in America, but it'll be throughout the world. You can already see incredible protests taking place in, in far-flung places like Hong Kong, Algeria, Romania. Our, our millions of people are massing in protest against their governments, and that's what has to happen in America. Uh, but Americans are reluctant at this point to do it. But I think that the truth, as the truth is exposed of a worldwide ring of, uh, of very corrupt people uh, at all levels of the government, that uh, eventually the swamp in Washington, D.C. will be drained. The government will be decentralized, which will be the real uh, determining factor of the draining of the swamp. And that the future for the world will really and truly be the dawning of a golden age or the age of Aquarius. When Aquarius is ruled in esoteric astrology by Jupiter, which is the most benign of all of the planets. Uh, you want to look and see where Jupiter is in your horoscope. Uh, it's a great uh, benign, beneficent energy uh, that can be uh, hopefully used by disciples around the world for the benefit of mankind. That's my hope. And I have it placed. Uh, very nicely in my horoscope. And I'm living in anticipation of that day where this Jupiterian force uh, will really uh, take control in my life. I, I don't know how many years I've got left, but I will make the most of them, I guarantee you, when that happens. And it may already be happening. So we have to remain resolute to work for the benefit of mankind, teaching and healing of your second ray, third ray, animal rights and protecting the animals, seventh ray, the environment, protecting and nurturing the environment. And uh, fourth ray is art and harmony through conflict. And uh, where I say live creatively, Salvador Dali was a good example of somebody who had a powerful fourth ray. Uh, he was also very esoteric in a lot of his artwork and understood sacred geometry. Barbara Cartland, the English uh, lady, uh, step-grandmother of Princess Diane, and Baker lived on her estate. Barbara Cartland used to go over to her house with Joe, drop off the rent checks, and uh, she would periodically be on television. You'd see her uh, extraordinary woman uh, wrote love novels, wrote something like 750 love novels. And she would start with a tape recorder and dictate the entire book all the way through. And uh, she lived creatively. Uh, her home where she lived was very uh, proof of a fourth ray. Let's just leave it at that. But she would periodically be on television in England, they ran out of interesting things on British television. So I, I love the BBC, uh, the special programming they do. And uh, Barbara Carlin would uh, speak to the English people about different aspects of living life. She had suffered tremendous loss in her life with uh, a brother who had been killed in World War II. And I think her father was killed in World War I. And a lot of death in the family. Uh, and it uh, molded and shaped her into a, a very uh, lovely human being. Anyway, what time is it? It's 8.30. Yeah, 8.30. And so we're going to, if there are no questions. Yeah, 8.30, you have to go. It doesn't yeah. matter. Okay. So we'll, uh, no we'll see you all next Wednesday. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you.